Let us pray. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we come to Thee once more. We thank Thee that Thou hast ever looked upon us and called us into Thy kingdom and called us to be preachers of Thy word. We realize, O Lord, the greatness of this office, and we realize our need of help and instruction. We therefore thank Thee that once more we come together to consider Thy word and its teaching in these matters. We humbly pray Thee, therefore, to look upon us and to bless us. Take from us, O Lord, prejudices, preconceived ideas. Grant us all that humility of spirit that will enable us to realize the greatness of the task. It is indeed a high calling, and we pray that we may realize this, and so prepare ourselves for it in every way that is open to us. We pray Thee, therefore, to bless our further consideration of these matters together. We ask it in the name of thy dear Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, now we are still looking at this uh, whole picture in general of a man standing in a pulpit and preaching to a number of people. And we've arrived at the point when we've looked at the preacher and his preparation and what he has to do in general. But now it seems to me to be equally essential that we should look at the people who are listening to him, the people who are sitting in the pews. After all, he is preaching to them. He's not just getting up there, as I've indicated, to voice certain of his own ideas and opinions, nor to give any kind of theoretical or academic disquisition on the teaching of the scripture. He is there primarily to address the people who've come together in order to listen to him and to what he's got to say. So this raises the question, for me to put it in the form of a question, what is the relationship between the pew and the pulpit, between the people who listen and the men who's preaching? This, of course, has become quite an acute problem at this present time, and in a new way. The old traditional idea of this relationship seems to be going. It's being questioned at any and queried uh, very seriously. And clearly this has reference to the last subject which we dealt with, which was the training of the preacher. Uh, obviously the relationship between the pew and the pulpit is going to have its effect upon the training of the preacher, and this is something that is being manifested in practice at the present time. Now, there can be no doubt at all that the new factor in this matter is that the great emphasis today is being placed upon the pew. Uh, in the past, uh, let's admit, uh, there may have been too much of a tendency for the pulpit to be almost independent of the pew. And the people in the pew uh, perhaps uh, revered the preacher, sometimes almost uh, to the point of idolatry. You remember the story perhaps of the poor woman going out of a service in a famous church in Edinburgh where a great and learned professor had been preaching and uh, somebody asked her on the way out uh, whether she'd enjoyed the service and she said she had and then he asked her were you able to follow him? She said far be it from me to presume to understand such a great man as that. Now, that was the old attitude, you see, but that is gone. That's no longer the case. And we are now in a new position in which uh, the pew is asserting itself and I think uh, more or less trying to dictate to the pulpit. Um, this is something which is stated in uh, many different ways. I've got some statements of it here from different angles. One man, for instance, says, The world is dying for want, not of good preaching, but of good hearing. That's a criticism of the listening of the pew. And so he feels that the great problem today is good hearing, not good preaching. But then the real emphasis is this emphasis upon modern men and the modern situation confronting us. Here are statements made by uh, a theologian who uh, is becoming popular, not to say notorious, on the continent of Europe, 
he says, moreover, it is of no genuine help to a Christian trying to find his way through God's world of this day and this place. That's a criticism which he has of the traditional theology and the traditional type of preaching. It is of no genuine help to a Christian trying to find his work way through God's world of this day and this place. Or again, a great many Christians convinced that faith and works are inseparable are nonetheless unable to discover for themselves how to focus this unity on the issues of our time. This is it. This is the emphasis. Or again, we have to know the issues uh, which, which are at stake in our time and place. It is here and nowhere else that the truth must be done. You see the obvious emphasis. Here and now, the situation today, the men of today. And you're familiar with this emphasis in a man like Bultmann, uh, who, uh, whose basic argument for demythologizing is that you cannot expect the modern men with a scientific background to believe the gospel, the message which he says he is anxious to convey, as long as it is tied up with a miraculous and so on, which the modern men cannot possibly accept. In other words, you see, it's what the modern men can accept that becomes the determining factor. And we are all familiar with this teaching about men come of age and so on. Well, now, I, I want to show how in practice this kind of attitude and mentality tends to express itself. Uh, it does so in the approach to what we may call the ordinary people. Uh, and concerning these we are told that today they can't think and follow reasoned statements. That they are so accustomed to kind of outlook and mentality inculcated by the newspapers and the television and the films and so on, that they're incapable of following a reasoned, argued statement. And that therefore we must give them films and film strips and uh, get film stars to speak to them and give them more singing and brief addresses with just a word of gospel thrown in. You create your atmosphere. That's the great thing. And then just get a very brief word of gospel in at the end. But it also takes this form that we are told that these people cannot understand the biblical terminology. Uh, that uh, to talk about justification and sanctification and glorification is meaningless to them. That we are living in a kind of post-Christian era. And that this is the greatest obstacle today. That people don't understand our terms. They sound archaic to them. They're not modern, they're not up to date. So there is this great craze for new translations of the scriptures in familiar, ordinary, everyday language and a tendency no longer to address God as thee and thou, but you. This, we are told, is all important. But to the modern men to hear thee and thou almost makes it impossible for him to listen to the gospel, leave alone to believe it. So we've got to change our language, and we do this in our translations of the scriptures, and in our prayers, and in general in all our preaching and religious activity. That's how all this modern attitude, which emphasizes the pew as controlling the pulpit, expresses itself with regard to the ordinary person. Then when you come to the intellectuals, what we are told about them is, of course, that they are now scientific, that... Uh, they therefore accept the theory of evolution and so on uh, and uh, this whole scientific outlook as it's called and uh, therefore that we must make it clear to them that the Bible only deals with matters of salvation or the religious life that it doesn't uh, touch anything else and that if we don't do this we'll offend this kind of modern intellectualist this modern scientist type particularly and they won't listen to the gospel. So we've got to stop talking, uh, as we have in the past, about 
the origin of the world and of men, and so on. And we've got to concentrate on this religious message. Of course, there's nothing new about this in a sense. Ritual did all this in the last century. But it's now come up in a, in a, in a new form. Then uh, another thing we are told is this, that uh, we've got to realize that the modern man, this intellectual type, is sophisticated. And that uh, he thinks in terms of modern literature and modern art and modern drama, and novels, and so on. And that unless we can address him in this idiom with which he is familiar, we are not likely to make any impact on him at all, that this is what controls his thinking. We had an extraordinary illustration of this attitude in a review of a book not many months ago in a religious periodical in Great Britain, where the man ended his review by saying that he thought now that if all preachers only read this book, there would be a new hope for preaching, because this book would force preachers to realize that they had better spend their Saturday nights in watching what is called in our country Saturday Night Theatre. And then having watched Saturday Night Theatre, they'd know the mentality and the outlook and the jargon of the modern men, and therefore they'd be able to preach to him in a better way on the Sunday. So this is the way you see in which you prepare Saturday Night Theatre, and familiar with the modern outlook. And then uh, the other form which it takes is this, that uh, this modern sophisticated men as a particular dislike of dogmatic assertions, and that he will not have these dogmatic pulpit pronouncements, that he's a learned man, he's not to be talked down to, he's the equal of the men in the pulpit, probably the superior, and that he believes in examining in things carefully and rationally and putting up the different sides. Indeed, I read in a, in a magazine belonging to an evangelical student's organization not so long ago, a plea to the effect that what the pulpit really should be doing now is to read out portions of scripture, particularly in the newer translations, and make a few comments and then invite questions and have a discussion. And so you have an intelligent service, instead of this one man standing up and laying down the law, as it were, and telling other people all about it. This participation on the part of the pew. So the man in the pulpit really is just there to read the scriptures in an intelligent, slow manner, according to these different translations, and then the discussion. Uh, there is the sort of statement of the mentality and the outlook. Uh, then, uh, in a very practical way as regards the training of ministers, it comes out in this form, that uh, there are those who say, that a man is not really fit to preach to uh, an industrial community unless he has had a certain amount of factory experience himself. And there has been a proposal quite seriously that all ministers, having finished their academic training, should then go and work in a factory, say, for six months, in order that they might get to understand the outlook and the mentality of the factory worker that they might get to understand his language and how he expresses himself, and that it is well nigh impossible for him to preach to them unless he has had this experience. Now, there I've stated the position to you in general, and the question before us is, what are we to say to this? To what extent is the pulpit, is the pew, to control the pulpit? Well, I want to suggest to you that this new kind of thinking about these matters is entirely wrong, completely wrong. And I'll give you some reasons for that statement. I, let me divide my answers into general and more particular. I say it's wrong in general in this way. I say, first of all, that it's wrong in fact. It is wrong in experience, I mean by that, it is wrong in its whole psychological understanding of the situation. Let me elaborate that. I shall never forget, and I put it in this form because I think it helps to make the point clear, I shall never forget preaching, oh, some 25 years ago, I suppose, if not more, at a college chapel in the University of Oxford on a Sunday morning. 
And uh, I had preached in exactly the same way as I'd preach anywhere else. I want to take up this point. I gather some of you are a bit troubled about this. And when we come to discussion, I shall be very glad to have this out with you. It seems to me there's a lot of confusion just at this point. However, I would preached, as I say, as I would have preached anywhere else. Uh, the moment I'd finished, before I'd had time to get down from the pulpit, the wife of the principal came rushing on to me and said, you know, she said, this is the most remarkable thing I've ever known in this chapel. I said, what do you mean? Well, she said, do you know that you were literally the first man I've ever heard in this chapel who has preached to us as if we were sinners? She said, all the people who come here because it's a college chapel in Oxford, they come and they've obviously been taking exceptional pains to prepare learned intellectual sermons, thinking we're all great intellect, she said. She said, to start with, the poor fellows show that they haven't too much intellect to start with, but they've obviously been straining and producing the last ounce that they can. And she said, we go away absolutely unfed. We've listened to these essays, she said, and our souls are left unfed. They don't seem to understand that though we live in Oxford, that we are nevertheless sinners. Now that was a statement of fact. The wife of the principal of the college. I remember a poor man, a good man, he'd done good work in a sort of industrial a church in an industrial area. He then got a call to a church in the suburb of another town. And uh, I remember noticing after a while, he came into the presbytery that uh, I happened to be in. I noticed after a while that the man was beginning to look tired and strained. And uh, I talked to him about this. We were talking together one day. And he admitted that he was very strained. I said, what's the matter? Uh, I said, you've had experience. He'd been a number of years in the other church and very successful. Ah, oh, well, you see, he says, he said, I've got, a, I've got a different type of congregation now. I've got these people who are living in the suburbs. Some of them were professional people, others were business people who had done well and had moved from living over their shop and had gone out into these suburbs. And here he was, poor fellow, trying to produce these great intellectual sermons. Well, what actually happened was this, that his people were complaining about the dryness of his preaching. It wasn't what they wanted. And indeed, I have very little hesitation in saying that the poor man ultimately killed himself. His health broke down, and he died at a comparatively early age through having this entirely wrong notion. It, it wasn't what the people expected at all. And indeed, one is constantly being given surprises. Uh, take this inability that we are told of, of people today in general to listen to sermons and so on, and long sermons. I was ill a year ago and received a number of letters during my illness, but the letter that I shall always treasure more than any other is this. And mark you, I'm uh, considered to be uh, not too easy a preacher to listen to. I tend to be long and I certainly don't spend my time in telling stories. However, the letter that I prize was a letter from a little girl aged 10 writing on behalf of herself and her brother, unbeknown to their parents, saying that they were praying for my recovery. and. Uh, hoping that I would soon be back in the pulpit. And then she gave the reason, which pleased me so much. She said, because you are the only preacher that we understand. Now, that isn't the reputation I have in Great Britain. The average, <laughs> the average evangelical in Great Britain would say that uh, uh, I am not uh, an easy preacher, that uh, I'm too much of a teacher, and that there's too much reason. And they'd never take their... Uh, newly converted friends to listen to me or uh, advise somebody who seems to be under conviction to come to me they say it'd be too much they, they wouldn't be able to follow and so on but here's a child aged 10 she says you are the only preacher that we understand i'm sure she's right uh, <laughs> and then and then to to enforce this uh, still further i've had this experience i don't know how many times people have come to me who have been converted and have then gone on and have grown in the church. And they've, some or another, something, some occasion has given them an opportunity of telling me what happened to them. And this is what I've been told so often. They said, you know, when we first came, 
we really didn't understand much of what you were talking about. Well, then I said, what made you come? Ah, they said there was something about the whole atmosphere that attracted us and made us feel that it was right. Then they said, this made us come. And we gradually began to find that we were absorbing it unconsciously. It began to get meaning for us, more and more. Still, they wouldn't get much out of us, but they'd get something. And that something was of great value. And on and on they'd grown in their understanding. Until now they were able to enjoy the full uh, service and the full message. This is, this is a very common experience. People at different levels seem to be able to extract under the influence of the Spirit what they need and what is helpful to them. And so you can preach like this to this mixed congregation of varying intellects and understanding and knowledge and so on. But then I would say that this modern idea is also quite false to the tradition of the centuries. You see, we are not the only people who have lived in this world. We tend to talk as if we were, of course, or that we are some peculiar special race. But there have been people in this world always, and you've always had these different types. But this is what Luther has to say about the subject. A preacher, says Luther, should have the skill to teach the unlearned simply, roundly, and plainly. For teaching is of more importance than ex exhorting. Then he says, when I preach, I regard neither doctors nor magistrates, of whom I have ab above 40 in the congregation. I have all my eyes on the servant maids and the children. And if the learned men are not well pleased with what they hear, well, the door is open. Martin Luther. And I think Luther was undoubtedly right. Uh, some of you doctors perhaps uh, have felt like that, that uh, not sufficient attention was being paid to you when a preacher was in the pulpit. But the wise preacher, he keeps his eye, you see, on the uh, servant maids and the children. And if this great learned man feels he doesn't get anything, well, he's condemning himself. He's condemning himself. He's not spiritually minded. He isn't able to receive spiritual truth. He's so puffed up and blown up with his head knowledge that he's forgotten that he's got a heart and he's got a soul. He condemns himself. And if he walks out, well, he is the loser. Um, let me again enforce this point by uh, telling you of an incident which I had, strangely enough, again in that University of Oxford. I was invited to preach in a mission there in 1941. And I did so, and it fell to my lot to preach on the Sunday night, the first service of the mission, in the famous pulpit of Cardinal Newman, afterwards Cardinal Newman, St. Mary's Church, where he preached when he was in the Church of England. And, of course, it was a congregation chiefly of students. But again, I preached to them as I had preached anywhere else, and as I would have preached anywhere else. And it had been arranged that if people had any questions to put, that an opportunity would be given to them if they retired to another building at the back of the church after the service had ended. So we, the vicar and I went along, expecting just a few people, but we found the place packed out. And then he took the chair and he asked if there were any questions. And a bright young man sitting in the very front, whom I discovered afterwards was uh, going in for law and was one of the chief officials at the famous Oxford University Union Debating Society, where the budding statesmen and so on learned the art of speech and of debate and so on. He is sitting in the front. His very dress betrayed what he was. He got up immediately and said he'd got a question to put. And he put it in a very charming manner. He tried to pay the preacher some compliments and so on, and that he'd much enjoyed it. But there was one great difficulty in his mind. And the difficulty was this. He really couldn't see, but that that sermon, which he'd listened to, which he admitted was well constructed and well presented, he couldn't see really, but that that sermon might equally well have been delivered to a congregation of farm laborers, agricultural workers and sat down, and the place roared with laughter. So the chairman turned to me for my reply, and the reply I gave was this, and it's still the reply. 
I said that I was most interested in this question and really couldn't see his difficulty because I had to admit that I might be a heretic, but I had to admit that until that moment, I regarded the undergraduates and indeed the graduates of Oxford University as just being ordinary common human clay like everybody else and that their needs were precisely the same as the agricultural laborer so that I had done what I had done quite deliberately. Well, this uh, again provoked uh, a good deal of mirth and laughter but the point was that they appreciated what I was saying and I was invited as the result of that to have the debate to which I referred in a previous lecture with the famous Dr. Joad. But that was how that occasion arose. You see, this, this is the fallacy, that you've got these special types. The facts have proved throughout the centuries that what is needed by them all is this same kind of message, same kind of preaching. And you get it coming out in the ministry of pre preachers like Spurgeon and people like that. But I want in the third place to show you that this modern idea is really based on false thinking. And this to me is very important. It seems to assume that the difficulty and the trouble with the modern man, the thing that prevents his believing the gospel, is almost entirely a problem of language and of terminology. This seems to be the reason behind the, much of this thinking. Now let me say at once, of course, we all must believe in having the best translations possible. We mustn't be obscurantist in these matters. Let's have the best that the translators can give us. But that, you see, is to miss the real point. This idea now that you've got to address God as you, rather than thee or thou, that if you don't do that, that it's going to make the preaching almost impossible, the people won't be able to listen. You see the assumption here that uh, the, the reason these people don't believe in God and don't pray to him is this archaic language. And if only that is put right, well, then a great difference would be made and they would be able to believe these things. But the answer is this. People have always found this language strange. This idea that uh, people today don't understand justification, sanctification and all the rest of it. The answer to that is when did they understand it? When did the unbeliever understand this language? The answer is never. This is something peculiar and special. It is our business to show that our gospel is essentially different. And we are not talking about ordinary matters. We are talking about something unique and special and, diff and different. And people are to expect this. And we are to assert this. And our business is to teach them the meaning of these terms. They don't determine. It's we. We've got the revelation and we've got to make this understood. You see, that was the great principle uh, of the Protestant reformers. That's why they produced their new translations. They wanted the message, as they put it, to be understanded of the people. So you explain it. It is the business of preaching to do this. You shouldn't expect people to understand these terms. The whole point of your preaching is to give them this understanding. And then, you see, the other false bit of argument is this. This idea that we've got to know the exact condition of people before we can properly preach to them. And therefore, as I say, that you may have to go and work in a factory for six months before you can preach to factory workers. Well, now, th this seems to me to be monstrous, because if this is true and is pressed to, to its logical conclusion, well, then your training will never have been finished. Because if you're to preach to drunkards, you'll have to spend uh, six months in the drinking saloons. And uh, so on, you'll have to go around all the various grades and differences and departments and spend six months in each lot. And then, and then only will you be ready uh, to preach to them. But the thing, I say, is quite ridiculous. Because if you press that, it surely would lead to this that you could never preach to a mixed general congregation. You'd have to have one service, one congregation of uh, the non-intellectuals. 
Then you'd have to have a special service for the intellectuals. Then you'd have to have one probably for those who are somewhere in between. And then you might have to have them for different ages. And then whether they're factory workers or professional people and so on. Well, the result is, you see, you'd be dividing up and atomizing your congregation. You'd never have a public act of worship and a, a sermon preached to all. You'd have to be dividing yourself up in this way. And your work would be endless. And in any case, it would be destructive of this great fundamental principle of the New Testament that we're all one as there is neither Jew nor Gentile, barbarian or Scythian, bond nor free, male nor female, I add there is neither intellectual nor non-intellectual, factory worker, professional men or anything else. We are all one in sin, one in failure, one in hopelessness. It's, it's to ignore all that. Or let me put that to you in this different form. Having spent uh, the first part of my adult life as a physician in medicine. I've often been interested in the difference between the work of the physician and the work of the preacher. And uh, there is a very striking difference. Of course, there are similarities, but the thing itself is essentially different. And the difference comes out in this way. What does the medical physician do? Well, the first thing he does, of course, is to uh, ask the patient to give him an account of his symptoms and his troubles, his aches and his pains, where it was, how long he's had it, how it began, has it varied, all this he has to go into in great detail, takes the history of the case. Having done that, he takes the family history. It may throw considerable light upon this particular ailment, it may be a familial disease, and so on. So the family history is also very important. And then, of course, he proceeds to make his examination. Now, without this detailed, specific, special, personal knowledge, the physician cannot do his work. And it's at this point, I say, there is such a striking contrast between the work of the physician and that of the preacher. The preacher does not need to know these personal facts concerning his congregation. This uh, is a point, of course, that comes up in another connection. Because people who are interested in giving testimonies and who believe in the value of that and so on, they attach great significance to this. That a uh, man hears of somebody else who had his weakness and sin and so on, hears a man getting up and saying how he was delivered from that, he was helped and so forth. Well, now, I say the difference is this. The preacher doesn't need to know this. Why not? Well, because he knows that all these people are suffering from the same disease, which is sin, every one of them. The symptoms may vary tremendously from case to case, but his job is not to medicate symptoms, it's to treat the disease. So that the preacher should not be over-interested in the particular form that the sin takes. Indeed, I, I, I'm very concerned about this. It, uh, it becomes a very important point, not only in preaching, but also when you give personal counseling and interviews to people at the end of your service. Some of these people will come in and talk to you, and you will find almost invariably that they'll want to talk about their particular sin. They've got hold of the notion, some of that if they got rid of this, one thing all would be right. That's the thing that you and I have to correct. We have to show them that though they get rid of that particular sin, they're still in as great a need as they were before. And that the business of salvation is not merely to get rid of particular problems, it is to put the whole man right in his relationship to God. So the preacher, he doesn't need to know this specialized detailed facts about his people because he knows that there is this general, this common need. And it is a part of his preaching to reduce them to that common denominator. He's got to show you a self-satisfied Pharisee that his need is terribly great. It's as great as that of the publican, if not greater. He's got to show you a great intellectualist who boasts of his knowledge and his understanding that he's guilty of a terrible form of intellectual pride, which is one of the greatest sins of all, much worse than many sins of the flesh. This pride of men trusting to himself 
and his learning and his knowledge. The man who comes to listen as an inspector instead of as a, listening as a sinner. He's got to be convicted. He's got to be reduced. So, you see, the preacher is in this position that he doesn't need to go into these different sections. He knows the problem of the factory worker. He knows the problem of the professional men. It's exactly the same. One may get drunk on beer and the other on wine. The point is they both get drunk. And so on with the various other manifestations. So I say, suggest to you that this approach is based on entirely wrong thinking. Indeed, it comes in the end to bad theology. And it's a failure to realize the true nature of sin. And that this is the problem. And that this specialization on the particular forms and manifestations is irrelevant and is very largely a waste of time. The great history of the church and her preaching throughout the centuries, as I've already reminded you, substantiates this argument. This general preaching is applied in particular by the Holy Spirit to the particular cases, and they're brought to see their same common fundamental need. And they're converted and they're regenerated in the same way by the same spirit. And so they mix together in the same church. And if they can't, well then they're not regenerated. It just comes to that. If they feel that they've been neglected, perhaps because of their great intellects or something, it shows that there is a fundamental lack of humility. They haven't been humble, as they should have been. The glory of the church is that she consists of all these types and kinds and all these varieties and variations. And yet, because they're sharing this common life, they're able to participate together and enjoy the same preaching. Well, there is the case in general. But I can imagine someone putting a question at this point and saying, but what about 1 Corinthians 9, verses 19 to 23? Let me read them to you. Paul, describing his own ministry, says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Now this, I think, is a, an important passage, because looked at superficially, it might seem to be the justification of much of this argumentation today, which suggests that the pew should really be controlling the pulpit. The apostle on the surface seems to be saying that, that what he does is determined by the people to whom he is speaking. Well, now, how do we deal with this? Well, there can be no doubt that in the main, the apostle here was dealing with his conduct and his behavior rather than his actual preaching. But I do believe that at the same time, he was also dealing with the method or the way in which he presented his truth. And we can surely come to certain conclusions. This apostle, of all apostles, but it was true of all the others also, obviously does not mean that the content of the message varies with the people. He is only concerned here with the form of presentation. I think we'll all agree about that. But now when we come to this matter of presentation, which is the thing that we're dealing with, what is the teaching? Well, it's obvious that there is clear teaching here to this effect, that we must be flexible as preachers. We mustn't be traditionalists. We mustn't be legalists in this matter. Now, there's a grave danger to many of us to become traditionalists and legalists. There are some people who seem to delight in using archaic phrases. And if you don't use them, they doubt whether you're preaching the gospel at all. They're slaves to phrases. Uh, I've known certain young men who've developed a a new interest, for instance, in the Puritans, 
who start speaking as if they lived in the 17th century. And the thing is quite ludicrous. They use phrases that were current and common then. And uh, they even try to uh, affect uh, a kind of stance and appearance, uh, which I imagine was characteristic of the Puritans, but which is no longer characteristic of Christian people. And they affect mannerisms. Now, surely all this is entirely wrong. We, we should not be interested in the incidentals or the temporary or the passing things. We should be interested in the principles and the things that are permanent. And that is what the Apostle of course is saying. He had to fight a great fight over this whole matter, as you know. He's been dealing with the question of meat offered to idols in the previous chapter. He has to deal with it again in writing to the Romans in chapter 14. People were tied by traditions belonging to their unconverted existence. And they were in genuine trouble about this. The Jews were in trouble, so were some of the Gentiles. Over these meats offered to Gentiles and so on. You remember the argumentation. Now what the Apostle is always saying is this, that while you hold on to the essentials, you must be elastic with regard to things that are not essential. Because he, he has to qualify this. He's concerned about the weaker brother. You don't trample on him. You try to help him. And you even uh, cease from doing things that are legitimate to you if they're an offense to your brother. Wherefore, he says, if meat make my brother to offend, I will eat no flesh while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Conscience not thine own, but the other also, and so on. But this is the thing that he is saying and saying very plainly and clearly that you mustn't allow prejudices to stand between people and your message. You mustn't allow your own personal fibles. You must be doing your utmost to help these people to whom you are preaching to come to a knowledge of the truth. So you don't, when you're preaching to the Gentiles, you don't go and insist upon certain things which certain Jewish Christians are still insisting upon. They're insisting upon them wrongly. But there it is, they are. You mustn't do that. Now, you remember Paul had to withstand Peter to the face at Antioch over this very matter. Peter had got into a muddle over all this, and Paul had to correct him publicly. He tells you that in Galatians 2. That's the sort of thing with which he's dealing here. I sum it up in modern terms by putting it like this, that it is always our business to be contemporary. Our object is to deal with the living people who are in front of us. I mustn't go into the pulpit with some wonderful picture which I may have and which to me is ideal of the Puritan preacher of 300 years ago and act as if I were that to these people who are in front of me. I'm doing harm if I do that. I'm, it, it would be an offense to them. It would be difficult. It's not essential to my message at all. I can learn from them, but I mustn't be a slavish imitator of them. I am helped by their knowledge of the truth and their expositions, but the things that were merely incidental, the things that were passing and temporary, I mustn't hold on to those and make these almost as essential as the truth itself. You are familiar with the kind of thing I'm saying. Well, now, this is the argument, surely, of the apostle, that we must have this elasticity in our actual mode of presentation. But let's be clear even here that there are certain limits to, even to this principle which we are granting. We mustn't be archaic and legalistic, but there are limits. And one limit, obviously, is that the end does not justify the means. This is a very common argument today. They say, but people are converted as the result of this. The end justifies the means. We don't accept that Jesuitical argument, and we have good reasons for not doing so. The end does not determine the means nor justify them. Secondly, our methods must always be consistent and compatible with our message and not contradict the message. Here, I feel, is the most important point at this present time. There are men who are quite sincere and genuine and honest and their motive is very good. Their concern is to bring people to salvation. 
but this so runs away with them that in their idea of being familiar and making it easy for the people, they do things which I suggest contradict their own message. Now, the moment your method contradicts your message, it has become bad. Let's have elasticity, but never to the point of contradicting your message. Now, this is not only right, of course, in terms of biblical principles, but it's even right in practice. And what always amazes me about these people who are so concerned about modern methods is their terrible psychological ignorance. They don't seem to know human nature. You know, the world expects us to be different. And this idea that you're going to win the world by showing that you're very similar to it, there's scarcely any difference at all, but a very slight one, is basically wrong, not only theologically, but even psychologically. Now, I can put this in the terms, again, of a very well-known example of this thing. At the end of the First World War, in Britain, there was a man who was very famous in religious circles, and he was known as Woodbine Willie. I don't know whether any of you have ever read of him. He's been dead a number of years. Why was he called Woodbine Willie? Well, here was the answer. He was a chaplain in the army in the First World War. And he was a great success as a chaplain. And apparently his success, he thought, and many thought with him, was due to this. That he mixed with the men in a familiar manner. And uh, he smoked with them. And he not only smoked with them, but he smoked their brand of cigarette. Now, hence the name Woodbine. In England in those days, they may be still there for all I know, but they were certainly there then. There was a very cheap kind of cigarette which was known as Wild Woodbine. You were able to buy five of them for a penny before the First World War. Uh, to my shame, I did so many times. Uh, now, th this was a very cheap type of cigarette. Not the sort of cigarette that an officer would smoke but the ordinary soldier, he smoked wild woodbines. So this man, in order to get them to be at ease, in order that he could evangelize them, he smoked woodbines, woodbine willy. Well then, you see, he not only did that, but he noticed that most of these men couldn't talk without swearing. So he would swear. He didn't want to swear. But of course, if you want to win them, you've got to use their language, and you've got to be like them. So he would swear and uh, use expressions and language which he thought would go down well. Well, up to a point this seems to, it certainly made him a popular figure. There's no doubt about that. But then, you see, he came back at the end of the war, and he used to go around the country teaching this, all preachers must do this. And many tried to do it and began to do it. But the verdict of history on this was that it was a complete failure, complete failure. And uh, so it's something that disappeared entirely uh, from the thinking of the church. But it had a great vogue. This was the way to do it. You see the fallacy? Our Lord attracted sinners because he was different. They drew near to him. They felt something about him. The poor woman in her sin, she didn't draw nigh to the Pharisees and wash their feet with her tears and wipe them with the hairs of her head. No, no. She sensed something in him, this purity, this holiness, this love. And so she drew near to him. It was his difference that attracted. And the world expects us to be different. And this notion that you're going to win people by showing them how similar you are to them is theologically and psychologically a real blunder. And of course, this is even happening in another sphere at the present time. There are foolish Protestants who seem to think that the way to win Roman Catholics is to show that there's practically no difference between us. Whereas the converted Roman Catholic will always tell you that what appealed to him was that we were so entirely different. It's wrong psychologically as well as theologically. And so I go on to point out that this must be wrong for the reason that the subject matter with which we're dealing with is so different. We're dealing with God and a knowledge of God and our relationship to God. So, because the service is under God, it's got to be with reverence and godly fear. We don't decide this. We are not in charge and control. It is God. It's His service. And He has to be approached with reverence 
and with godly fear. Furthermore, light entertainment, easy familiarity, jocularity is not compatible with the seriousness of the condition of the soul and its lost estate and its need of salvation. And not only that, such methods cannot bring out the truth. And our business is to pray, preach the truth. These methods may affect people, they may lead to decisions. But our object is not merely to get decisions, it is to bring people to a knowledge of the truth. And beyond this, we must never give the impression that all that is needed is for people to make a little adjustment in their thinking and ideas and terminology. That is to militate against our message. Our message is that every man needs to be born again. And that whatever may happen to him short of that is of no value whatsoever from this standpoint. The unbeliever is all wrong. It isn't merely his ideas of modern art or of drama that's wrong. Everything about him is wrong. And his particular views are wrong because his whole view is wrong. The rule is, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. But if you put all your emphasis on these other things, instead of on seeking first the kingdom of God, well, you're doomed to failure, and you are doing despite to the message that has been committed to you. No one has ever been reasoned into the kingdom of God. It is impossible. It's never happened. It never will happen. We are all one. The whole world lieth guilty before God. We are in the same condition. And so I argue that all that passage in 1 Corinthians 9 teaches is that we are to do our utmost to make ourselves clear and plain and understood. We are never to allow our own prejudices or foibles or things that are incidental to the message to be a hindrance to the message. We are to be all things to all men in that sense and in that sense only. So I end by saying that the real trouble with this outlook is that it forgets the Holy Spirit and His power. We've become such experts as we think in psychological understanding, dividing people up into groups and nationalities and saying that's all right for one nationality and not for another. You know you deny the gospel when you say a thing like that. There is neither Jew nor Gentile barbarian nor Scythian, bond nor free. And if you think you can explain a thing away in terms of nationality, you are denying the gospel. This is the one gospel, the only gospel. It's for the whole world and the whole of humanity. And mankind is one. And we have fallen into the grievous error of adopting modern psychological ideas. And in the end, we use that to evade the truth sometimes to protect ourselves from the message, and certainly often to justify message, methods that are not consistent and consonant with the message which we are privileged to deliver. Very well. I leave it at that for this afternoon and will complete it, God willing, tomorrow afternoon. We do hope that you've been helped by the preaching of Dr. Martin Lloyd-Jones. All of the sermons contained within the MLJ Trust audio library are now available for free download. You may share the sermons or broadcast them. However, because of international copyright, please be advised that we are asking first that these sermons never be offered for sale by a third party. And second, that these sermons will not be edited in any way for length or to use as audio clips. You can find our contact information on our website at mljtrust.org. That's mljtrust.org.